Good morning. Good morning. My name is Evan. I am a uh, old friend of Eric's. Uh, not old, old, but uh, we've known each other a really long time. We went to seminary together. His wife and Eric and I uh, met the first week of seminary back a long time ago. Eric and I spent a lot of time together washing dishes for the seminary for lunch and dinner. You get to know someone really well when you're sweating to death in Manhattan. It's 85 degrees and uh, you're running a dishwasher nonstop. Um, okay, thank you. So we, uh, we've known each other for a really long time, and Eric invited me to come this weekend uh, to preach. I think he wanted you all to have the opportunity to meet an average transgender person. See, nothing too spectacular, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I, you have to be patient with me because I've retired. I'm retired. So he really had to convince me with good food to come because I don't get up in the morning anymore. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, I, I agreed to come if he would, he and Susan would feed me, which they've done beautifully. And, um, and I'm so happy because I love today's gospel. There are 23 healing stories in the, in the gospels. And out of the 23 of them, this is my favorite. I love the Seraphonician woman, right? She comes up to Jesus because her daughter has a demon. And she finds him and throws herself on the ground and says, Jesus, heal my daughter. And he says, no. When do we ever hear Jesus say no? Right? So right off the bat, it's pretty strange. And she says, Jesus, heal my daughter. And he said, I didn't come here to waste food on you. I'm here to feed the children of Israel. And I love it because she does not miss a beat. And she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from the children's food from the table. Ha! <laughs> and Jesus has this moment that you don't hear anywhere else in the Gospels. Anywhere. He goes, aha! She's got a point. And he said, okay, because you said that, your daughter's fine. Go ahead, go home, everything's great. And she goes home and finds her daughter healed. It is one of the most comforting stories to me in the Gospels. Because it says, if this Seraphonician woman, this outsider, this foreigner, can come to Jesus and plead her case, and make him open up his eyes and look at her and listen to her and say, I'm worth it, Jesus. My daughter is worth it. And he goes, yeah. That is so comforting for us, right? Because what can we not bring to Jesus then? There is nothing we can't bring to Jesus and say, help me with this. I have a, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from um, uh, early 14th century um, uh, religious, uh, she was a spiritual writer, she was a, a political activist in the you know, early 1300s, which is pretty amazing for a woman to be. And she, um, she wrote a lot and she was a strong influence in the church and she wrote something uh, and she's quoted a lot, and she's this St. Catherine of Siena, and she said, be who God made you to be. Be who God made you to be, and you will set the world on fire. Isn't that a great quote? Be yourself. And I love this quote now, but I used to struggle with it, because I would sit and have this internal turmoil why can't I be happy with who God made me to be? Why can't I just be happy? Why am I always struggling with who I am? And I, uh, I mean, this wasn't a new problem. I'd been living with it really my entire life, since I was very little. But when I was 21, I went to a, a gender therapist, which back in those days was pretty rare, and um, started dealing with it and decided I just wanted to be normal. 
just make me normal. And, uh, and I continued to struggle. And so in my 50s, I said, I got I to gotta resolve this. I can't continue to live not being in this conflict constantly. So I found another gender therapist. <laughs> and I said, this is it. Either I stay as I am or I change, but I can't keep doing this. And um, obviously, I changed. And I learned that this is who God created me to be. Why? I have no idea. God could have made it a little easier on me. <laughs> you know, a little bit taller, a little thinner, you know, s s just, it could have been easier. Lots of people have it easier. They're perfectly content with who they are at the very, from the very beginning. Except we're not, are we? Nobody's, nobody, I've hardly met anyone in my life who is happy with who they are all the time. Because there are things about us that we hide. Things um, where, I, here's an example. I, I love my stepfather. He was, he was my dad. I adopted him when I turned 21. Took his name um, because he was my dad. But he, we would get, and he came into our family when I was 13. Vulnerable time. And we'd be in the car and the radio would be on. And this is in the 70s, so there was really good music. And... Um, <laughs> And I'd be singing along with it, and he'd say, you like this song? I'd say, yeah, I love this song. He said, well, then shut up and listen to it. <laughs> it took me years to be able to sing out loud in front of people because, I was, because he had told me I couldn't sing. I'm not the greatest singer, but I'm not bad. You know, I'm not going to go on American Idol or anything, but... Um, but uh, but it was so instilled in me. It wasn't until I was in, in music class in seminary and we had to do an oral exam where we had to come in and sing for the music professor who, who wrote a ton of our hymnal. So he's pretty intimidating. And you had to just do it. And I had bronchitis, so I sounded like this. And um, I went in, I was like, hi. <laughs> shaking, just shaking. And, and he said, just do it. <laughs> come on, I don't have all day. So I do, the, I do the oral thing, and he gives me my uh, paper, and he said, you have a lovely voice. Any congregation would be happy to hear it. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> but it took, someone, it took someone years and years and years to, to let me believe that. And we all have things because we're taught or told, you know, you're this, you're that, you're, and we believe them. Right? They get, in, they get into us somehow, insecurities. Um, and, and I found that when I let Jesus into the picture and didn't try to, to say who I could or couldn't be and just said, this is who I am, amazing things happened. I, um, I am an Episcopal priest. I served in a, con in a congregation. It was, I was there 18 years when I decided to transition. It was the scariest thing I've ever done. I thought, I'm going to lose my job, and I love these people. I've been with them 18 years. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my home. And the scariest thought was, I'm going to lose my dogs. I couldn't live without my dogs. I, have, I, had, a lot of, I had a lot of dogs. I have four dogs. <laughs> all rescues, and um, I went to the vestry. I wrote a letter to the congregation, made sure I sent it out the same time that I, right after I spoke with the vestry, so everyone would find out at the same time. And I went, scared to death, went to the vestry, and a couple of people I had talked to in advance, preparing the way, and I, and I went and I told them, and they asked me to leave the room. And I went outside for what seemed like forever. And I'm like, oh my God, they're deciding to fire me. What am I going to do? And they came out and said, come back in, please. And I sat down and they said, we decided we love you. And we're going to walk this journey with you. It was amazing. Um, I am the first Episcopal priest in the world, in the world, to transition and not lose my job.
And I got to say, that doesn't say anything about me, but it says a whole lot about that congregation. That in the Midwest, in a very conservative community, they were willing to stand by me because they knew who I was, they trusted me, and they loved me. Um, I, had, I, I came out on Facebook a little later, and I had had neighbors who were very devout Nazarenes. So it's a, a lot more conservative than the Episcopal Church is. And I was worried, because they had been my neighbors for years. They had moved by then, but um, they were like family to me. And she wrote, and she said, we read your announcement, and we had a family meeting. I was like, oh, no. They're two kids and the two adults, and, uh, and the kids were pretty grown by then. And she said, uh, and what we decided is you were the best neighbor we've ever had, and we love you. Again, just out of the blue. And as people learned, they were coming to me and saying, you know, that just makes so much sense. <laughs> or, I am not at all surprised. I mean, the people who knew me the best were like, oh yeah, this has been coming for a long time. Um, but I found peace. That being myself, only being myself, could bring. That, that deep abiding peace. That conversation that I struggled with for so many years was gone. And I became me. Um, and what happened was I ended up having all this new ministry to do. Because people were coming to me and saying, my grandchild is trans, what do I do? Or my grandchild's questioning, could you meet with us? Uh, just, just one person came from a really conservative church, wanted to see me really con most conservative church in our diocese and i'm like why is he coming down here to see me and i'm like he's bringing a gun with him right i'm really scared and uh it was his mother was dying and he wanted me to do the funeral anyways he finally one day says to me i'm transgender and i was like what <laughs> and he has since she transitioned to she and, uh, and managed to deal with the kids and family and everything. And, um, but it just shocked me. Um, and, it's, and it's given me a freedom that, and, and, uh, and new opportunities that I never knew would exist. And that's not just me. That's true for all of us. Because we're each individuals. We each have our own personalities and quirks and even all that stuff that you hate about yourself God is going to use because it's it makes you you right you know if if uh, I had a funeral for someone once and I started by saying did you hear the one and everyone laughed because this was a guy who every time you saw him said did you hear the one <laughs> he always had a joke but every, each one of us has this uniqueness about us that we're called to honor and to, and, to, and, to, and to care for ourselves so that we can be used by God for who we are. Not as someone else, not pretending to be someone else, not, uh, not to hide. That's what St. Catherine is saying, you know, if you allow yourself to be fully who you are, who God knows you to be, you will bring the love of God. You will bring the Holy Spirit with you. And, and you will feed people. You'll be who someone needs. Just only you. You know, you ever run into somebody that you haven't seen for a long time? And, and it's like that, you have this intense interaction because somehow God is using you in that moment. You know? It's because God knows us. In and out. Every single one of us. I... There's a quote from Irenaeus that said, the human fully alive reveals the glory of God. And that's each of us. It's each of us fully living our lives, allowing ourselves to grow into who God knows us to be. So it's, it's, it's turned out to be a gift, not a burden. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions at, uh, at coffee hour or after coffee hour, whenever, whenever you have that thing. <laughs> but remember that you, you 
as an individual. You with things that you want to hide from others are who God made you to be. And we have our whole lives to live into it. So trust that. Trust that God knows you better than you know yourself.